Catherine. Thank you. To start, I'd like each of you to think about a tricky manual task that you recently accomplished. Perhaps you put together a coffee table from Ikea, <laughs> or lit all 47 candles on your friend's birthday cake. So how is it that we as humans are able to accomplish this wide range of intricate manipulation tasks in the physical world around us? Certainly it helps to be able to see these objects and to be able to hear things, but I primarily credit our hands and our sense of touch with endowing humans with this brilliant manual dexterity. So you may not realize it, but your hands are densely enervated with receptors that measure all sorts of useful things, like pressures and vibrations, where things are touching your hands, stretches and temperature. And all those sensations together enable you to figure out what that object is that you're touching, and if you're holding something and touching things through the environment, understanding how that manipulation is proceeding to get that goal that you're trying to accomplish, put that coffee table together. And so what I think about is if the sense of touch is so useful to humans, why are there so few computer and machine interfaces that provide useful haptic touch-based feedback? They're beautiful graphics and great audio. And so why is it? That's exactly what we work on in my lab at the University of Pennsylvania. So we seek, my students and I, we seek to engineer new haptic technologies that take advantage of the richness of the sense of touch and how immediate it is that you feel things, how useful that kind of feedback is to humans, to try to enable people to do things they couldn't before in a huge range of applications. And so up there are a bunch of different projects we've done over the last four years. And of course, given only five minutes, I'm going to only tell you about a few of my favorites. So in the first one, I wanted to create a tablet computer that would let you feel surfaces and objects on the screen of the computer instead of just seeing them. And so to do this, we re make recordings of the accelerations that you feel as you drag a tool across different textures. And so that tells you the identity of that surface. And then we also had to augment the stylus with some vibration actuators. These are voice coil motors, voice coil actuators. They can shake the tool. They work a lot like speakers. And we put those two things together. We have a mathematical model of the vibrations you would feel. And then we play them out through the tool to give you the illusion that you're touching a real surface, even though you're just touching the screen of a computer. So we're adding touch into these digital interactions. I call this whole process haptography, haptic photography, and I hope it can be useful in things like online shopping or medical simulation. We've also had a lot of success applying the same fundamental principle about the value of these vibrations and contact transients to a different domain, that of robotic surgery. And so here what we do is we augment what the surgeon sees through the camera and we let them feel some of what the tools, the robotic tools are touching. You can see those orange clips, we add accelerometers way up high on the robot arms and then voice coil actuators near the surgeon's hands. And we connect them in real time, we play the signals for the surgeon to feel. So that if they're doing a manipulation, say tying a knot, and there's a collision like that one, we can measure that and play it for the surgeon so they can feel it right there at their fingertips. And they start to believe much more that those little robotic tools are their hands. And so a lot of other actions cause useful vibrations that we can measure like cutting or suturing, handling like suture needle. And the surgeons who have tested this really, really like it, how it makes it feel much more immersive. And so I hope that adding technologies like this to robotic surgery will make it easier to learn to do and uh, maybe eventually deliver better surgical care. The last project that I want to tell you about, um, we're working to make autonomous robots more haptically intelligent. I want to make this robot, the PR2, able it, I want to make it able to manipulate all of these everyday objects that you see and more, and uh, so that it could maybe help put away your groceries or clean up your kitchen. Wouldn't that be great? And so what we have to do, even though these objects have all these different properties, and the robot may never have seen that object before, we 
work with the sensors that are available on the robot hand, even though it doesn't look a lot like a human hand, we can take advantage of what neuroscientists understand about how humans process the different tactile stimuli, all those different things you can feel, the changes in pressure, the vibrations that occur when you set an object down, to make the robot very carefully choreographed to capably manipulate a wide range of objects. So maybe I put a plum, a soft plum out there, and the robot can pick it up without crushing that plum, or maybe a raw egg, and it could hand it to you or put it back down on the table. Now, definitely, when the robot finishes cleaning up your kitchen, you need to celebrate. And so we've also programmed the robot to do high fives. And here again, it's feeling the physical contact between you makes a very fun interaction. And my students, my students explain fist bumps are way cooler than high fives. So of course, we had to make the robot do fist bumps as well. OK, so that's all the projects that I have time to tell you about today. But if you have questions about these or anything else you see up here on the slide, please come find me at the conference. I also want to take a brief moment to acknowledge all the great students I have working with me in the Penn Haptics Lab. And I also thank you for your kind attention. All right.